Okay, hi. So uh, my name is Sam Blackshire. I'm the creator of Move and the co-founder and CTO of Mistent Labs. Um, I'm going to be talking about work that we've been doing with the Move Core and Move Innovation teams at Mistent, as well as with the Suite Developer community. So I want to start off by giving a huge thank you to Move Funds DAO and the APAC Move Developer community. You know, this language has basically been my life for the last six years. I've just poured a, a ton of time and energy into it. And Move Funds now folks have been around since the beginning. They've been extremely loyal. They've been extremely enthusiastic. I think they've understood the, the vision of the language. And, you know, somebody like Joel Starr, who's giving a talk later today, like, has literally started looking into the language and like building on it the the day after it went public. It's it's really inspiring. And then that's in the past. But the thing that I'm really excited about is how much energy there is going forward. Uh, just the exciting things that people are building, how quickly they're iterating, the feedback they're giving. And so I'm I'm really really grateful to have the opportunity to speak here and for the for the energy of everyone in the community. Okay, so here here are the things I want to talk about today. So. I'm going to start off by giving a recap of Move 2022 to 2023. Move has had a lot of growing up to do since the Libra days. And I want to talk about three foundational improvements we've made since that time that give Sweet Devs special superpowers. And I want to give you examples from the community of these superpowers in action. And then the second, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to give you a preview of what's coming in Move in 2024. This is both forward pointers to other talks going on at the conference, uh, as well as a couple of, of features that I'll go a little bit deeper on. So the, the theme, I, I would say the theme of the work on Move from 2022 to 2023 that we've been doing is the safe and expressive foundations. Of course, safety is at the is the bedrock of the language. Uh, it's it's the entire purpose of it to do more, to do safe, secure smart contract programming. And the thing we've really been focusing on is how do we expand the expressivity so we can handle all the use cases folks are going to care about in Web3 today and beyond while retaining that core safety, or if we can, even improving on it? So there are, there are three big ones here. So the first one is the object data model. This is the core building block for Move Smart Contract Programming. I think it's the single biggest advance we've made in the language since, the, since it was created. Then we have programmable transaction blocks, or PTBs. These are a very powerful mechanism for code composability. And then we have dynamic fields, which are um, an equivalent mechanism, but for data composability instead of for, for code composability. So let's start off by talking about the object data model. So when you write code, when you write a move code in SWE and you write something like struct obj has key, you've just created um, a SWE object. And so what that means is that the first field of the object has to be called ID. It has to be of type UID. And what that thing is, is it's a globally unique identifier for the object. Uh, you can refer to that object by that ID in move code. You can look up the object by that ID from the client. Uh, you can pass it into a transaction. Uh, it's guaranteed to be different from all other object IDs. This is sort of like your handle or like the, the unique name for the object. You can also say that, say or not, that the object has store. And if you say that it has store, what that means is that this object is freely transferable. You don't have to manually implement transfers. Uh, you can uh, use this universal polymorphic transfer function called transfer, and then you can, can transfer the object around wherever you want. And so if you have a function, if you want to do something that transfers the object, maybe you're doing a conditional transfer, you would write code like this. It takes the object as input. It takes the address you want to transfer it to, and then you just type transfer OA, and you call that same function uh, regardless of, of what object type you were transferring. And when you write code like this, what's happening is the you have the move object itself, this obj thing, but then it's wrapped in an outer SWE object that has some metadata inside of it. Metadata like what's the last transaction that touched this object? Of how much? How what's the storage rebate that's inside, inside another things? And the most important piece of metadata inside here is ownership information. Uh, who, who owns the object? And so when you do transfer OA, what that's doing is. It's, it's saying, okay, the owner is the address A, but the ownership metadata can be several other things. You can say this object is owned by another object. You can say this object is shared, so uh, it can be used by, by anyone. This is how you implement something like a DEX or an auction. Or you can say this object is immutable, which is how you implement something like a, a move package or a coin metadata that's never supposed to change. The other thing you get natively is client-side visualization. There's this display standard that any object can implement that says, okay, here's how I want my object to show up in an explorer or in a wallet or on the client side. And if you implement the standard and use the, the display SDKs, then uh, you just get a nice rendering of your object. So what do, the, what do these SWE objects do for programmers? So like, the most important thing they do is that you get object access control checks performed by the SWE runtime. If an object is owned by address A, the runtime is not going to let you use the object at all unless uh, it's in a transaction sent by A. So this is a big improvement over 
you know, say the state of the art in Ethereum or other smart contract languages where you have to manually implement ownership instead of it being a native platform primitive and you have to do manual checks. And if you're doing manual checks uh, and you miss a check, then you can introduce a vulnerability uh, if you miss the check or if you get it wrong. And the other thing too is these manual checks add a lot of boilerplate uh, that makes it less pleasant to read the code and, and less fun to write as well. The other thing they do is they give you a consistent vocabulary throughout the stack. So if you're a move dev, you're programming, you're thinking in terms of objects, um, you're creating objects, but then there's no translation barrier between you and the folks that are using your move powered application. APIs read objects directly, apps and wallets and explorers display objects. It's just a common vocabulary, lingual fraca throughout the stack that everyone could talk about and be on the same page instead of having to bridge this gap via functions or wrappers or special glue. Objects also enable some advanced standards uh, that you're gonna hear more from Demir about later in the conference, like kiosk and closed loop tokens that are going to rely heavily on these this native transferability and this native ownership metadata. And finally, and this could be a, a whole subject for a whole different talk, the native object ownership metadata uh, enables ultra low latency transactions. We get 480 millisecond end-to-end -end latency uh, in SWE via consensus, via SWE's consensus, consensus fast path. Um, and then because we're able to distinguish when an object is owned versus shared and do special fast things uh, when it's owned. So now I'm going to show you an example of how folks are, are using the objects to build stuff that's really cool. I mean, objects are at the center of everything that you're that you're building on Sui. So I think like any example could work for this, but here's one that I think uh, fits particularly well. So this is an app that's built by the, the Bucket team. Uh, it's got this cheeky name, BuckU. And so what this app does is that you log into the app. You can use your, your wallet or you can use ZK login, and it'll show you all of the coins that you have and all of the NFTs you have. And so when you see the coins are NFTs, these are sweet objects. The reason they show up nicely with this picture is because the, these objects implement the display standard. And then when you see when you see the objects, you can click on a couple and say, hey, these are the ones I'd like to send. And you click on create link. Once you do that, you create a link, you get a QR code. Uh, you also get a link that you can copy and paste. Someone can scan the QR code uh, to, to claim the objects. They can send the link via a text message or in an email. Uh, however you want, however um, it's easiest to share it. Then when somebody actually clicks on the link, what they see is something like this. Uh, here's a link where someone has uh, allowed someone to claim 0.1 bucket USD. And so the person who gets this link can click ZK login with Google and just claim that, claim that USD via their email. No need to install a wallet. Or if they have a wallet, they can connect it and they can grab it into there. So how do I, so, okay, the, that's the app view, but what's under the hood? How are objects enabling these universal claim links? So the way this works is that on the create link page that I showed, it's showing all the objects that have store and thus are freely transferable. And it's using the display standard to render them in this nice human readable way. The thing that's really neat about this is that for any given object type T, the app doesn't need to explicitly support T. Buck U doesn't have to build in support for every new object type that comes out. It's just automatically supported as long as um, if someone is using sweet objects, which they always are. And similarly, the creator of T doesn't need to say, oh, I'd like for my uh, object to be able to be used in claim links via the Buck U. Uh, they don't have to think about that at all. As long as they've added store and implemented the display standard, it's just going to work. And so when you do create link, what's happening there is that you're transferring objects from the original owner to some temporary account A. And when you claim via a link, you're transferring objects from A to a wallet or a ZK login address. And then this can be paid for using a sponsored transaction or a small gas coin that's included in the object bundle. And then, of course, you can, uh, you can remix this a little bit. Uh, you can say, this object has to be claimed by a specific email, not just by anybody who has the, the link. You can say, this can be, if nobody claims this after a certain time period, the sender can reclaim it. You know, any policy you can express in move, you can add this. So this is a superpower for onboarding and growth. This is one of the biggest problems in Web3. Uh, we can, for the most part, folks can only use apps if they are in a wallet installed, and that's a fairly small and idiosyncratic group of people. So this is huge for onboarding and growth. You can send an asset to anyone with an email, and there's no wallet install needed. Like I've I've loved playing with Buck U and ZK Send and these other kind of apps. You know, I can share stuff with my family and friends who are not crypto people, but just so them like this is cool or interesting. Uh, it's it's an immense difference from always needing to have a wallet. So let me now talk about the second this second fundamental improvement, which is programmable transaction blocks or PTBs, which are a mechanism for code composability. So in Suite, transactions can directly accept objects as input, and a single transaction can call a move function or can call several move functions up to up to 1,024 uh, at the up, up the upper limit. And so this is useful for a bunch of things. Of course, you can do batching. If you write payments code, you don't have to explicitly implement a batch payment API. You just sort of get that for free by having multiple payments in the PTB. Similar for NFT minting, don't have to implement batching explicitly. It's just done for free. So that's sort of the basics. But then I think where PTBs get really interesting is that 
you can do heterogeneous composition. You can call different functions, and then you can pass output objects from earlier functions in the PTB into later uh, functions in the PTB. And so it's sort of like there are these strongly typed Lego bricks where you have arguments flowing out of earlier calls into later calls, and everything just composes together very nicely. And then the, the other thing I want to call about PTBs is that they can be constructed on the fly in the client. You know, in DM, we used to have this script feed, we have this script feature, which does something somewhat similar, uh, but there you have to manually write move source code the, that's doing something, and then you have to run a compiler and then produce bytecode. And it's very hard to, you know, say in JavaScript, uh, automatically write move source code and then call a compiler. Really what you want to do is just uh, build something on the fly and like very native JavaScript -y code. And so that's exactly what PTBs let you do. So this is an example of PTB construction code in TypeScript from the move scriptions project. Uh, so what this is doing is, it's going to call the burn floor inscription function. And that function returns two objects, a coin and a, a burn witness type. And it's taking an object, uh, this market share object as input. Then they're going to add a second move call to the PTB. This time we're calling buy with burn witness. And here we pass in the burn witness we got in the previous step. We pass in the coin and we pass in some other objects of uh, this tick record and then OX6, which is the clock. So this is a simple PTB with two calls, but you know you can do this with up to 1024. You can mix and match objects. Um, let me actually show you PTB that uh, is doing something a little bit fancier. So here's an example where uh, a PTB is being used to do a flash loan, a multiple arbitrage that's leveraging a flash loan. So in this PTB, uh, it starts off by borrowing some funds from Scallop. It then does swaps on three different DEXs, uh, Aftermath, CreateX, and Cetus Protocol. And then it repays uh, the, the original funds back to Scallop. So the thing that's interesting about this PTB is it's touching four different protocols. None of these protocols implement common on-chain interfaces. None of them need to explicitly integrate with each other. None of them have code that calls each other. They're sort of agnostic to the existence. Yet the person who sent this transaction is able to write some write code that interacts with all four of them at once without publishing any new code and by paying a very, very low gas fee, less than a cent. And so it would, Jane from the Suivision team shared this example with me. And what she said is that, okay, this integrates with three DEXs and it uses Scala, a flash loan. It's impossible to implement this directly in the EVM without a complicated proxy contract. You have had to publish new code that's you, that's doing this less safe um, interfaces and proxy dispatch feature just to accomplish the same thing. So the thing that's really cool about PTBs is that they're safer and more powerful than interfaces. And so this is a superpower for DeFi builders. If you had to publish every possible combination of swaps between different DEXs and clubs that anyone would possibly want to do, you would never get anywhere. You really need to have a dynamic composition feature like this to, to get the most out of DeFi. And finally, let me talk about dynamic fields. So this is the a data composability feature. So if we look at the code on the right, it says struct DOM has key, you know, it's got an object ID, and then it's got F, which is a normal field. And so what dynamic, of course, like we've all written code like this, we can see the, the ordinary fields. What dynamic fields let you do is you can add and remove fields to an object on the fly. So here, like, let's say we want to attach coins of several different types to, to object, but we don't know in advance what types we're going to add or how many they're going to be, and we might change our mind later. So what this code is doing is saying, okay, add a new coin of type T to my object. So first, uh, we grab the type name from the, the generic type T passed in, and then we write that to a dynamic field. So dynamic fields hang off the ID of an object. We say, oh, that ID of T equals coin zero. And now that object has a zero balance in that coin. And we could do that to add, you know, whatever combinations of coins we want. We can then remove the coin later, all, all of these sorts of things. And there, this is quite flexible. You can add dynamic fields in the declaring package of the object. You can do it in the original code. You can add dynamic fields to an existing object after an upgrade, which is really useful if you've decided you wanted to add a new field and want backward compatibility. Or this is a little crazy, but uh, there are some use cases for it you can let an external package decide to add dynamic fields uh, into your object. And so the other cool thing about dynamic fields, uh, objects have a size limit. The fields in a, like F count toward the size limit. For dynamic fields, you can add unlimited dynamic fields to an object. Uh, they don't count toward the size limit because they are implemented differently under the hood. So what do dynamic fields do for programmers? They're under the hood of all large collection types. If you use a big collection like table or link table, and you go and look at the, the standard library code, you'll see under the hood there are dynamic fields. These are collections that all have the same type of thing in them, like you know a table of coins or NFTs or something. You can also have heterogeneous collections like bag. A bag can have coins in it, it can have NFTs in it, it can have capabilities in it. You can you know, mix and match whatever object types you like. And it also gives the, the community flexibility to implement custom collections. Like the, the typist lab folks have implemented this big vector type, type that works really well for their protocol that's leveraging 
the flexibility of dynamic fields under the hood and um, have also sent a SIP to try to pull this into the framework. As mentioned before, it also allows update upgradable objects. You can add new fields after the fact. And then the most powerful thing that you can do, and I'll show an example of this shortly, is that you can build composable object hierarchies. You make a, if an object is a dynamic field, another one is kind of like a child, but then you can add another object to that dynamic field and you can sort of nest this and structure it uh, as long as it's tree structured as deep as you want to go. So this is useful, say, if you want to implement NFTs that have accessories, you want to implement a game character that has an inventory, uh, you're implementing a um, decentralized web service and you want to DOM element with children, you have a multi-asset deposit and a lending protocol. All of these are cases where suite builders reach for dynamic fields. So here's an example. Uh, so sweet friends is this NFT collection and a sweet friend is, you know, this is a little bull shark. It looks like this. And sweet friends originally had accessory, uh, native accessories. Like these goggles were a native for sweet friends accessory. And then Pebble City, this cool new game from NHN is coming in. And they said, hey, we want to do a collab with sweet friends. We'd like to have our own custom Pebble City accessories that also belong to Sweet Friends. And so, for example, this jacket here is actually a, a Pebble City accessory. And so if you go and look at a Sweet Friend in the Explorer, what you see is, okay, here's the object that's a Sweet Friend. And then the, the, the goggles are one accessory and the, the jacket is yet another accessory. And so basically the, the way this is working under the hood is that the Sweet Friend has a bunch of different slots for accessories. Like there's a torso slot, that's where the jacket is. And there's an eye slot, which is where the goggles is. And so how this works with dynamic fields is you have the Sweet Friend, that's an object of this ID. And then you have this dynamic field type. It has a key and a value. The key here is eyes. Um, and then the value is the, the object ID of the accessory. And then it's the same on the torso. And so the thing I want to call out here is that these accessories actually have different types. Originally, Sweet Friends only supported these native accessories. But then for the Pebble City collaboration, introduced a new accessory V2 type that's parameterized by whoever wants to create accessories. So today it's uh, Pebble City, but tomorrow it might be someone else. And so you can have native and external objects and these compose seamlessly. This is a superpower for NFT, NFT devs, game devs, and social devs. Okay, so that, that wraps up the first part of the Move 2022 to 2023, 2023 recap. I'm going to talk about Move 2024 now. So Move 2024, uh, we're continuing with the theme of, of strong foundations, doubling down on that. Uh, and we're also moving into advanced, we're also going to be focusing on advanced tools to accelerate Move development and suite development. So on the safe and expressive foundations front, uh, I think the headline item is the Source Language 2024 edition. This is a, a big chunk of work with new language features like enums and macros. It's been a long time in the works. Todd's going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. There's some new ZK login features. Uh, there's a talk from Joy tomorrow about that. Uh, as I mentioned, Demir is going to be talking about kiosk and the closed loop token standards and some of the design patterns behind it. There's this very powerful transfer to object feature that Tim from our team has been working on where before you can transfer to an address but now you can also transfer directly to an object ID uh, and have that work quite naturally. And there's some very powerful things that enables. And then we're also working on providing secure native on-chain randomness APIs. On the advanced tools front, we're working on more advanced package and source management to make it easier to discover move source code and use move source packages in your project. Manos is gonna be talking a little bit about that later today, I believe. And also an object-centric GraphQL powered RPC. We're adding comprehensive linters. We're, we've done some of this, but there's going to be more enhanced IDE support. And then also a project that we call Move to App Compiler. So many of these are covered in depth by later talks in the conference. I'm going to go a little bit deeper on three particular ones that we don't have dedicated talks for. Okay, so the first one is secure on-chain on randomness. This is coming to mainnet in Q1. So the way this works uh, is quite simple to explain. There's a new random type under the hood. This random type is instantiated with safe randomness that's bootstrapped from the SWE consensus protocol. And you can use this type to generate random integers, random bytes, you know, whatever, whatever you can think of. And so the, the only rule with using random is if you have a call that's the, taking a random object as input, it has to be the last one in a PTB. And the reason we need to do that is you need to discourage these so-called composition attacks. So like if you allow someone, if you're going to allow someone to play the lottery at the flash loan and then abort if they if they lost the lottery, uh, that, that wouldn't be very good for the lottery. So we protect you from that by ensuring that the, the random is the last call in the PTB. And from use, the use cases perspective, um, this is good for tons of things, you know, for, for loot boxes and games, for NFTs that have random elements inside, uh, for games that have elements of randomness themselves, for lotteries, like, there are many, many different applications. And so just to show how this looks, I think it's fairly straightforward, but if you wanted to mint an NFT that has some element of randomness, you take the, the random as input, uh, you have your TX context, and then you just call generate U64, uh, maybe you're, you're creating an NFT with random rarity, 
And then you can generate that NFT and transfer it to the sender by reading off the TX context. The next thing I want to talk about is object-centric RPC via GraphQL. So I, I spoke about this vision of having the objects be the, the common vocabulary throughout the stack. The object-centric RPC gets us a lot closer to this goal. So the before, it was not so efficient if you're trying to, say, do a map or a filter over all the objects in SWE or, all of, or a large number of dynamic fields in a big collection. And this is all now highly efficient. And especially like if you're, um, it has less back and forth. Um, there's a lot of queries before that would have required multiple round trips in the RPC and with lots of pagination. Now, you do, even if you uh, are doing a, a scan over a large number of objects, you don't get any pagination uh, unless the final result is very large. And usually like what's happening is you're doing an RPC call that's looking at a bunch of objects. It's picking a small set and then you'll get those back at the end. Something else you get is atomic query batching. A challenge with RPCs where you have to do a lot of back and forth is that you want a consistent view of the state. Like, you know, I want to know everything about the objects at time t exactly. But if you have to make make a query and then make another query, the state may change in between the time of your first and second query and you get inconsistent results. So with gra with the GraphQL RPC, you can pass as many queries as you want at the same time and they'll all read sort of the same snapshot of the state. So here's some examples of things that you can do. This is very basic stuff. All of these are single query and with no back and forth. If you talk to the folks working on this, they can really bend your ear with even more sophisticated examples, but you can get an object in all of its dynamic fields. You can get all the objects of a specific type. You can get all the dynamic fields and match a filter um, and, and all of these sorts of things. The other thing that this enables is that RPC providers and apps uh, today, if they want to do, if they want custom endpoints or custom secondary indexes, they're in sort of a tough spot where they have to do a custom index or a fork it. But here, the we've explicitly made the RPC extensible. So you can add custom post processes that builds indexes on your objects or events expose endpoints for those, and you can do it with the default code instead of having to, to fork anything. So in Move, we've always focused a lot, of course, on the smart contract authoring experience, but there's just as much going on uh, when you have to use Move code from the front end and from the back end, and this is uh, reflecting uh, how to make that really, really convenient and really fast. And the final thing I'm, I'm going to talk about is what we call the Move to App Compiler. And so the background on this is that when we look at apps that we build and we look at community apps, there's sort of a rule of thumb that the app is maybe 5% move and 95% front end and other stuff. And so if you want to accelerate development, like of course you want to accelerate move development, but it's just important to think about how can we leverage the nice structure that we get from move itself and from objects to automatically generate a lot of that 95%. And so, you know, if you look at a, a typical app that's using move, like you see a lot of code, like the TypeScript type definitions that are duplicating the move ones, serializers and deserializers between TypeScript and move, TypeScript function bindings for the move code, PTP construction code, use, and then you know uh, GraphQL queries or RPC queries, and then bindings for those. And so what we want to be able to do is, if you give us a move source package, we want to be able to generate an app that works end to end that you can start playing with in the in the browser or on the phone right away. Now this isn't a, an app that you'd ship to production, but it's it's an interactive visual aid that's really useful for testing and prototyping, and we want to generate it in a way such that it isolates the the useful li useful libraries that you would need to use if you're building a real app. Maybe you use this and you play around with it in prototyping, and then you grab the, the serializer deserial libraries, maybe you grab some of the queries, and then you've got a much better start with building with building your app. And so this can be done manually, you know, just uh, take the take the libraries and start using them. Or the thing we're really excited about is, okay, we've got these nicely structured libraries, LL, it's in TypeScript, LLMs understand TypeScript very well. Maybe we can actually get very close um, for simple use cases to generating an, an app end-to-end -end with the help of LLM, or at least like entering a feedback loop to do to do fancier stuff. So we're pretty we're pretty excited about this. And I think like the the combination of move its strong types and the objects is like the nice structured representation of data are really going to make this a, an interesting and powerful project. So these are all the things that I want to talk about today. Uh, I've annotated the the big items uh coming in, in 2024 with their with the dates we're expecting them. You can see that this is really loaded towards the, the front of the year. So um, the, we're talking about the stuff coming as soon as first. Uh, and we've got a couple of other uh, items in the fire too that, that you're going to hear about later. So please check out the talks by by Todd, by Joy and Demir, and by Manos. And thanks so much for listening. All right. Um, thank you very much, Sam, for giving us an uh, excellent speech.